There we go. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I am your host, Olga Peters. And if you are joining us today, we are very happy that you are. And joining me is regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, who is one of three representatives for the town of Brattleboro. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Olga. And all the way from South Burlington via the interwebs, Matt Coda. Thank you so much for joining us today, Matt. Thanks for having me, Olga. Thank you, Emily. And for listeners who might be new to us, you can also find us on Emily's YouTube channel, as well as BCTV and iTunes. You can subscribe to our podcast if you so desire. So, Matt, I don't think there is a single person in Wyndham County who is not interested in some way or another in climate change. And they all have their different approaches for it. But I just want to launch right in and talk about, you know, the states has passed the Global Solutions Act, Global Warming Solutions Act, sorry. And it's participating in a 13 jurisdiction regional program called the Transportation Climate uh, Initiative. Mm. And so it's taking a number of different approaches but we still need to make a transition from energy that we've been using for decades to energy that does not use so much fossil fuels. And I think I hear from a lot of people, this kind of scares them sometimes. You know, what will it mean for them? Will they be left out? Can they afford this transition? Um, can you just kind of dive right in there and talk to us about transitioning? You know what's funny, Olga? I thought when you said there isn't a single person in Wyndham County who hasn't, who I thought you were going to say who hasn't heard Matt's last name. Um, right. Well, I wasn't going to just launch him in because, you know. <laughs> well, well. If so if Matt, you could start explaining sort of how you come to this topic and your relationship to Wyndham County. I think that would be great too. Yeah, yeah and, I'll, and I'll do it briefly, and I appreciate that, Emily and Olga. So I run a nonprofit trade association called the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association. Uh, it's been around for about 60 years. Uh, I've done this for the past 15 years. Before that, I was a journalist. I was a journalist in Santa Barbara, California, and in Burlington, Vermont, and in Washington, D.C. Um, I grew up in Bellows Falls. Well, actually, I grew up in Westminster West, went to schools in Westminster, Bellows Falls, and Saxons River. Uh, before I went off to school, only to have children out in California and then move back here um, to Vermont, first to Plainfield and then to South Burlington. So the trade association that I run, I do a number of different jobs. Number one, and most importantly, I train the drivers and the, and the heat techs, the people that fill your tank with oil or propane, or the people uh, that are in your basement fixing your boiler or furnace, making sure that it's working, making sure it's working at peak efficiency. Though that's the school that I run that trains those technicians that keeps the heat on in your home. Uh, I also do advocacy work uh, in the state house, um, and that was revolves around uh, any business that sells or installs heating equipment, heating oil, gasoline, diesel fuel, um, and that type of thing. Uh, while my background is in journalism, I come to this um, partly because uh, it is in my family. Uh, my grandfather and grandmother started a heating oil company back in 1941 in Bellows Falls, Vermont. They also started the first ever 24-hour gas station in uh, in Vermont, and that oh, happened in that. Bellows Falls. Yeah, and it's called Code and Coda uh, because it was named after Ken and Helen. Um, Ken drove the truck, but Helen was the business person. Helen was way ahead of her time. Uh, she wanted to make sure that her name was on the billboard on the on the sign. But she was also the one that was the, the business person in the relationship, and uh, she was very good at it. Uh, that company now owned by a cousin of mine. I worked there as a teenager, but uh, I don't have any interest, uh, financial or otherwise, in it. Other than I work for companies like Coda and Coda, like Dead River, like Barrows and Coal, like, uh, like hundreds of other companies in Vermont that sell fossil fuels. So over the last 15 years, of course, as you described, Olga, the concern as it uh, has, has progressed over the past 15 years has been primarily climate change. How are we gonna reduce carbon emissions in Vermont 
in the Northeast, in the United States, in the world, uh, how are we going to continue to have the energy that we need in order to continue our way of life? Um, and, and we've seen a tremendous progression over the last 15 years. Certainly, uh, 10 years ago, uh, with Governor Shumlin in his advocacy for a natural gas pipeline in Rutland County and Addison County, the idea was that we were going to have a bridge fuel, that we were going to use natural gas in order to get to a lower carbon future. And now we have a different type of energy mandate in Vermont and elsewhere. Um, in, particularly in the Northeast, which is to electrify the thermal and transportation sectors to make sure the grid is entire, entirely uh, powered by renewable energy. And that's going to be our, our energy future. So you, you talked about the Transportation Climate Initiative. There are other initiatives as well, all with the same goal in mind, which is to reduce the amount of fossil fuels that we use to heat our homes and power our vehicles and to increase the amount of renewable electrons we use for those same purposes. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that in various proposals uh, promulgated by the Climate Action Council, which was created by the Global Warming Solutions Act. We're seeing this in regional approaches such as the Transportation Climate Initiative. Um, and we are absolutely um, uh, seeing that in policies that are uh, or bills that are adopted in the state house, which is how we can reduce the amount of fuel that we use in transportation and thermal applications through conservation, weatherization, higher efficiencies, uh, in how we can transfer some of that thermal load or some of that trans uh, transportation load to electrons. Um, and can I jump in for a second? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a very good lefty representative from Brattleboro and I know my constituency and I buy organic and all of those things. I still have two fossil fuel powered cars, including a pickup truck that's, you know, almost 20 years old now. I have oil tank in my basement and an oil furnace. And I don't see a clear path for myself out of that either. And so when I have these conversations, I very much have this goal of a low carbon future. My partner works full-time to on grid modernization, but I'm hyper aware that like most, you know, this is a big lift for most families. And unless we make this financially viable for the folks that are working in your sector, Matt, and we make it financially viable for regular ho Vermont households, we're not going to find equitable solutions. We're going to leave a lot of people behind. And that's not the kind of Vermont that I'm working on. Right. It, yes, and I appreciate that point. And Olga's orig original comment, which is, um, you know, everyone's talk talking about it. That's true. Um, you know, 15 years ago, I would say, you know, um, we were still arguing about science, right? Mm -hmm. We're not arguing about science anymore. We're arguing about math now, <laughs> which is, you talked about your 20 year old truck. Um, the average car in Vermont registered is 9.7 years old, okay? So think about how, it, how we are going to meet our mandated goals as provided in the Global Warming Solutions Act. When the average person still has a, 97% of us still drive a fossil fuel powered vehicle and we don't trade it in for another decade. So every car that's being sold now will be on the road for another 10 years. How do you meet the statutory goals of reducing carbon emissions and transportation uh, unless you ban those sales of those vehicles. And I don't think that's going to happen. There are some that have suggested it, but I don't think that's going to happen. And it's certainly not going to happen before 2035, which is where California and other municipalities have thought about banning the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles. So how do you meet those goals when you still have internal combustion engine vehicles, gasoline powered vehicles on the road? It's going to be difficult. Same thing on the thermal side. So on the thermal side, about 200,000 Vermonters choose natural gas heating oil, excuse me, 200,000 homes in Vermont uh, choose natural gas, heating oil, kerosene, or propane to heat their home. Um, about 40,000 Vermonters use wood, okay? About 5%, five, about, 5 about 10,000 Vermonters, 10,000 Vermont homes use electricity. So how do you convert what is 70, 75% of, uh, of Vermont homes into an all electric heat source? especially when some of those homes are over 30, 40 years old and haven't been weatherized. So in fact, it makes it more expensive. Whether you're, whatever heat source you choose, uh, if your home isn't weatherized, um, you're not, you're wasting energy regardless, whether it's and renewable energy or, or fossil fuel energy. And that's most of the homes, right? Yeah. In Vermont are not weatherized. 
So, you know, we've gotten this, you know, pitch from, um, first of all, we install electric coal climate heat pumps, far more efficient than resistance heat that we ripped out of homes in the 1970s because they wasted too much energy and they cost too much. Um, also provide cooling. So uh, tens of thousands of these things have gone into homes, Mitsubishi L LG devices. They do a great job uh, in terms of cooling our homes. They do a great job uh, in, the, in the fall, in the spring. But, but most homes, not new homes with R30 insulation and, 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 and you know, built very well from an efficiency standpoint, but most existing homes will still require a backup source of heat, which can be um, propane, can be heating oil, can be kerosene, can be natural gas, can be wood, can be coal. Uh, but we'll need a, a source of uh, combustion heat or resistance heat backup uh, because they won't be able to, well, it was in South Burlington last night, it was negative eight degrees with a wind chill. Even if you had a cold climate heat pump, you needed a backup source of heat in order to, um, in order to keep your pipes from freezing. Just so, Wyndham County, I want to make sure you all noticed that it was eight degrees here and negative eight degrees there. So if you ever think about moving there for better yeah. wages, know that our weather is better. Yeah. At least. Yeah. Well, you are in the South, the banana. Yes, belt. banana belt. So, so, the, so the issue is, is again, math, which is um, our, our carbon reduction goal is important. Absolutely. Uh, now that they're a mandate, uh, how do we, how do we do that in the world in which we don't have... I mean, the most popular car in Vermont is not a car. It's a crossover. It's an SUV. It's a truck. It's a light duty vehicle. It's a heavy duty vehicle. So how do you, yes, can you trade in your, your Toyota Corolla or your, or, your, or your Toyota whatever for a all electric? Absolutely. But we still have a problem where we don't have an affordable vehicle that Vermont consumers who travel on dirt roads want to buy. We don't have an all, all viable alternative for diesel powered vehicles. So we're left in this, this, frankly, this policy conundrum where we have some pretty significant goals that if we don't meet, not goals, mandates that if we don't meet in terms of carbon reductions, um, we'll be sued and we'll have to devise ways to meet those goals. That's what's in the Global Warming Solutions Act. But we've got a real math problem. So in this space comes this idea that perhaps the way we've been going for the last five years, which is to electrify everything, get a renewable grid and electrify transportation and thermal, and that there has to be a middle way. There has to be a Can way. I, Go ahead. So I, you know, I think even the push to electrify everything has more complexity than we're often include in it. So, you know, even if every house in Vermont is able to move to full heat pumps through some sort of, you know, water systems inside. Anyway, if we're able to entirely electrify, we're all driving electric cars. Our grid right now is at a point where the way it's run, when we get to sort of peak, um, peak times of consumption, we're actually incredibly fossil fuel dependent to create that electricity for peak areas. So our grid is not even red. It's electricity is not magically green energy, especially in the absence of nuclear power, not to, you know, make this an even more contentious conversation than it already is. But <laughs> our grid is not magically green. It is electricity and electricity is produced through things like coal and fossil fuel in a lot of cases. So I think even that path is something that needs um, a lot of investment and negotiation. But you're talking well, about that, a middle way before we even get to right. it. But that's a really, really important point, Representative Cornyn, because in, in 2018, during the bomb cyclone or polar vortex or whatever the, the meteorologist's clever name they put to it, when we had 14 days in a row of below zero temperatures, um, in order to keep the green full of electrons to avoid what happened in Texas, um, the natural gas that, that pro provides the turbines, a low carbon electricity, um, they had, to, they had to be shut off because the natural gas had to supply the heat to all the homes. And instead came the backup fuel to a natural gas power generation, which is heating oil. So in just two weeks to keep the lights on in 2018 during the polar vortex, the New England grid utilized 80, eight, excuse me, used 82, uh, excuse me, 800, what was it again? It was 800 million gallons or something like that. Of, no, it was 84, 840 million gallons of heating oil. It was an outstanding number, which had an effect of raising the price of heating oil for everyone else that was using it because there was this rush to get heating oil to power the grid. So we're in this market regardless. As the demand for electricity increases, 
what we have is we have a um, uh, an increased demand on all the other fuels in order to keep the electrons running when we are at peak demand, which is on a night in January, in the middle of the night, when we need the most electrons possible. So you're right, it's not it's not 100%, even if we're 100% green in the fall or the summer, we're not 100% green when we need the electricity the most. But back to the middle way. So, so if, you, if you think about how we create electricity or how much we use electricity, there all has to be a common denominator or a common metric. And that's British thermal units. 150 years ago, someone in Britain figured out you know, what it took to get a pound of water to raise one degree Fahrenheit. And so we have British thermal units. So you can change kilowatt hours, you can change therms, you can change uh, gallons into BTUs. And if you look at that, 80% of the BTUs consumed in Vermont are from fossil fuels, 20% are electricity. So if we're gonna move that dial, move that grid, and so more of our BTUs come from renewable electrons and less from fossil fuels, um, obviously we're gonna need more electrons, but we can't still get to our, in our opinion, we still can't get to the mandated carbon reductions without it. So what, what, what is the middle way? What is another alternative other than renew renewable electrons? Well, it's biodiesel and it's biomass, right? So products that we do sell, we currently sell, um, uh, products that are helping reduce the carbon emissions all across the country, but are, aren't counted in Vermont currently at all. Um, there are many companies that sell it, but there's no incentive to sell it. There's no mandate to sell it. There's no regulation that requires them to sell it. It's more of a marketing campaign, but in other municipalities, in New York, in California, in Minnesota, uh, selling biodiesel, in fact, counts towards uh, reducing um, carbon emissions and counts towards the goals of those states in terms of their of their uh, um, carbon emission reduction mandates. Can I better? On, so I remember a time, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago when a whole lot of folks in Brattleboro were driving their cars with biodiesel and there was like a French fry oil co-op. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's what you're talking about. So, well, yes. Yeah, it is. So, in, so it's you're talking about French fry oil co-ops and <clears throat> old Volkswagens? No, no. I didn't think. Okay, but, but but that is that is the roots of it, right? So the roots of it are are how can you? So the same heating oil that goes in your tank in your basement that that fires up into a burner in a combustion chamber that heats air in a boil in a, in a furnace or, or water in a boiler. It's the same fuel that goes into the school bus, the farmer's tractor, the the locomotive engine, and into a, a Volkswagen. Um, or another diesel powered vehicles. It's the same number two distillate, number two fuel oil, right? It's taxed differently depending on the use, but it's the same fuel. Um, is the same fuel that is biodiesel that can be created from used vegetable oil. And it is in Haverville, New Hampshire where they produce 2 million gallons a year. And that is, that is largely what comes into the Vermont market um, in, in Newport biodiesel in Rhode Island. But it also comes from um, soybeans. So a soybean grown in Nebraska, 80% um, of that soybean goes to, there's two, two commodities off one crop. You grow a soybean, 80% of that soybean goes into the, into the fiber market, goes into feeding pigs and cows. The 20% of that, of that bean is, is oil that goes into the oils market. And that becomes the biodiesel, which is powering vehicles um, and is added to the number two distillate supply. So, so you know, what, when we drive a car that uses diesel fuel, it contains less than 5%, but more than 0% uh, biodiesel. When you put uh, oil heat in your home, it contains more than 0%, but less than 5% uh, uh, biodiesel that comes from either used cooking oils, fats and tallows, or soybeans. Why is that that way? Why do we have that? <laughs> How come we don't know the exact amount? Because upstream, according to the renewable fuel standard, the major oil companies and refiners have to blend renewable liquid fuels into their supply or make an alternative compliance payment. Also, they, that has established a renewable identification number, so they get credit for doing it at the federal level. We don't get any credit at the state level for reducing carbon emissions by selling a blended product, but they do at the state, but they do at the federal level. Additionally, there's federal tax policy called the dollar uh, biodiesel blenders credit. So biodiesel producers get a dollar off per gallon or get a dollar in, in tax credits by, by sending that fuel downstream. In other words, the cost at New York Harbor for number two fuel oil, the same fuel I put in my 
uh, Volkswagen or you put in your fuel oil tank is the, uh, is the, is the exact same price, give or take five cents, um, of the straight B100 biodiesel. So in other words, we have a renewable fuel that is cost competitive with distillate fuel, with, with fossil fuel. Um, we have a federal energy policy under the Obama administration that encourages its, its production, its sale and its blending. We have other states that in fact count those carbon emission reductions toward their renewable energy and, and carbon uh, reduction mandates. I think Vermont is gonna be there in about the next 18 months. Can so, I, sorry, I'll go ahead. Just uh, one quick question and a note, we're just about five minutes before the, the break. So it sounds to me like you're, you're saying this biomass biodiesel is the middle way and it sounds a little bit like you're saying you'd like to see the percentage of the mix maybe start skewing more towards soybean and less towards fossil fuels. So, so what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is I understand the science, I understand the urgency, and I understand the desire to reduce carbon emissions, and I understand our statutory, our mandates in order to reduce carbon emissions. I also, I also believe, which is not a universal belief that we can't get their electricity alone, that we are going to need liquid fuels to power our snowplow trucks, our school buses, um, our, our heavy duty vehicles, and the 100,000 homes in Vermont that continue to rely on liquid fossil fuels in terms of heating oil and can't or can't, can't afford or their structure won't allow them to convert to electric heat in a, in a cost effective way. In that space is an opportunity through through policy uh, that, that's made in the state house in order to both incentivize and encourage the use of biodiesel blended heating oil to both reduce carbon emissions, increase the amount of renewable fuel available, uh, excuse me, renewable fuel um, that we consume in Vermont, but without a mechanism to count it, other than feeling good about it, and maybe putting a bumper sticker on your Volkswagen said this, this vehicle is powered by bi biodiesel, there is no incentive for the market to bring it here. And that is what has to change. Can we produce a renewable, a domestically produced renewable liquid fuel that can be interchangeable with current distillate fuel of which we sell 200 million gallons, 200 million, 100 million gallons in the heating oil market, 100 million gallons in the on-road market. Um, that represents a third of our liquid fossil fuel consumption. Can we, slowly increase the amount of renewable distillate, renewable soybean oil that is mixed into that blend, absolutely. But we can't do it if there's not an incentive structure to do it, a regulatory uh, um, paradigm in order to make that happen. Uh, now, if you think that uh, we should simply electrify everything, that we should have all renewable grid and we can get there um, with electricity, you may be opposed to this method because you want, you want the all electric all the time. I understand that. I just don't think it's possible. I don't think the math works studying this for 15 years. And I think you need another alternative and that includes renewable liquid fuel. It also includes biomass fuel, uh, pellets, uh, wood. Um, so um, I think Thank that's you. the direction we're gonna go. Um, but that's- Just before we have to, thank you, Matt. Before we have to go to break, Emily, what, what are your thoughts? Um, with huge apologies to people who drive those little Volkswagens that I'm thinking of as the object lesson here. Um, I, and it's not 20 years ago. They, they, they're still going. Oh, I know. I know. That's, <laughs> that's why they, they're a helpful object lesson. I think we can all imagine what I'm talking about. But um, when I think about this idea of bio, biodiesel, I don't think all biodiesels are made equal. Um, and so I think it's sort of the the boundaries of what is greenwashing and what is reality is very fuzzy here. And so the one, there's the question of how much do you need to add into a mix to actually make it a marginally sustainable product and a meaningful product to be selling as an alternative. And then I think there's also the question of where does that fuel come from? Where does that oil come from? I think in the example of the French fry co-op, you're talking about waste oil. And when you're talking about soybeans, you're talking about a really intensely exploitive agricultural commodity that is deeply already subsidized by the federal government. And mm -hmm. so I think there's a lot of questions about how we actually produce that oil that is not quite as intense, you know, as um, talking about the 
you know, colonial powers that have taken over some of the countries and the deep history of civil war for some of our oil extraction. But it is certainly um, a conversation that needs to be had if that is the direction we're going to move into. And I think we're going to go on break. So I'm sorry to leave that pile right before we go there, but we can yes, but back up hold those seconds. thoughts, Matt, because I want to, those are great questions and I want to return to it. So the Montpelier happy hour will be back after we hear from some of our underwriters. So don't go away. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and if you are just joining us, I'm speaking with regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, as well as Matt Coda, and we are talking about energy and <laughs> energy generation and renewables and biodiesel and biomass and this tough conundrum we call climate change. So right before the break, Matt, Emily raised a really great question about um, biodiesel. And Emily, if you don't mind just quickly rephrasing that for listeners who might just be joining us again. Yeah, absolutely. I think when we talk about biofuels, um, we come up with sort of any of the same questions that we come up with, with any of our sort of, you know, green solutions that are mass produced. Um, I think we where is it grown? What is the environmental impacts of that growth? And how much do we need to put into the mix to make it a legitimately green product? And so, you know, when we talk about soybeans, I think the sort of history of industrial agriculture in the U.S. has had some very intense impacts and is very heavily subsidized by the U.S. government and, you know, by our taxes. And so I think it's an interesting question about there's a, it's a far cry from the French fry waste. Um, and I don't think we could ever eat enough French fries to have enough waste to produce all that. But there's also, you know, I think we've talked about industrial hemp and what that looks like. Um, I think there's a lot of options for cre creating fuel from more things than we create fuel from. But Olga talked about, you asked me to rephrase and I'm just adding more words than I had before. Mm -hmm. um, sorry about that. You know, and Olga talked about where things are produced as an important part of the mix too. And so, you know, here in Vermont, we're often talking about wood when we talk about things that are produced, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think part of the, first of all, yes, in, in any discussion about alternative fuels, there is a, a healthy discussion that has to be had on what impacts they are, whether you're talking about where you get the the metals the precious metals for batteries that we oh, need yes. or whether you're talking about um you know um crops that we're using um and i and i think i can speak specifically to um to the crops issue because there has been starts and stops and, and we can see like what was bad we can see what we have what 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 is likely to happen and then we can see the future so what is awful and what is no longer viable and is no longer in the United States, but was for a short amount of time was palm oil, was palm trees grown for their oils, which had a devastating effects to other areas that there is no more palm oil because it doesn't get credit and there's no value in importing palm oil. So most of our biodiesel does come from domestic crops. Um, it comes from used cooking oil, but that's again, only a small part of it, as you suggest that we don't eat enough French fries here. Uh, it comes from animal fats and towels. It comes from canola um, and it comes from soybean oil because soybean uh, produce the most oils out of the crop. But keep in mind that the soybeans are being grown for protein. The most of the commodity off of soybean is for the protein. Um, and that meal is then sold for the, for the uh, agricultural animals. Um, and, and that's what's driving the market. The oils that come from it used to be something that used to uh, uh, be a, 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 a very minor part of that commodity. It used to be, you know, in fact, the, the French fry grease that Baker Commodities truck goes and picks up or Jim Malloy in Plainfield picks up for his Black Bear biodiesel, that used to be something that you'd have to pay, you'd have to, pay to get rid of. Now you get paid to put it in a canister outside the back of your restaurant. So the market is changing. It is certainly um, improving. And what we're creating is a product that is sustainable, but it gets confused often, unfortunately, with ethanol. So ethanol is like alcohol 
like gasoline. So ethanol is an additive to gasoline. Up to 10% of the gasoline you put in your car has corn-based ethanol. And there you have both an energy problem, the amount of energy it takes to make a gallon uh, of ethanol is very poor. Um, and, um, and you have the food versus fuel argument. You know, those fields that were creating corn in the Midwest and Iowa um, are creating a fuel and not a food. We don't have that problem with biodiesel. In biodiesel, we are creating food and fuel with the same commodity, which makes it so enticing. And we don't have that energy issue rather than a 1.1 to one or 1.1, I've seen a number of different analysis where with ethanol, you know, we got a three to one issue. One unit of energy is creating uh, three units of energy from biodiesel. So it's a much better, but we're still under that because we're mostly a gasoline um, nation in terms of transportation, unlike some European countries, um, that somehow that has been lost in the shuffle. Um, so, but but it's not going to be just liquid fuels. It's also going to be we've seen a lot of um, my member companies um, sell um, figure out more efficient ways to sell biomass mm -hmm. um, pellets, mostly um, how we can deliver them to homes, um, how we deliver them in trucks or in bags and experimenting with different types of stoves and, and automatic pellet feeders and boilers. I mean, this is the type of innovation that can happen um, in cold weather states because we are, you know, we've got a company in Barrie called Pellet, Pellergy that is designing um, boiler systems and pellet feeders. I mean, this is sort of the exciting energy space when you're talking about thermal. And when it comes to the oil companies, the traditional oil companies, you know, my grandfather and grandmother, when they started a fuel company in Bells Falls, um, one of the first things that my grandfather did was, was tear out all the coal bins because mm -hmm. we were primarily coal heated homes. All those beautiful Victorians that you see in Bells Falls that have been around for a hundred years, um, those were all coal heated. They probably still have some coal in those basements in some of those homes. Um, but in the 1940s, they were being converted to kerosene and, and, and oil heat. And now we're seeing sort of a uh, sort of a some of these homes are going back to biomass through pellets using using similar type bins uh, and uh, and delivery mechanisms um, to to burn biomass uh, renewable biomass fuel um, and then some are moving to a blended product um, and 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 most companies are changing their names you know they're no longer oil new companies aren't putting oil in their name. They're, they're energy companies because they realize that it's not just about selling one commodity, it's about selling multiple commodities and most importantly, selling a service, which is comfort, which is being able to be uh, a company that you call to make sure that the heat is working and that your home is comfortable. And that includes energy services, such as weatherization um, and, and, other, and other products. Because a lot like farmers, that realize they can't just sell milk in order to uh, make an income and pay their property taxes, Fuel dealers are finding out as the number of gallons per home declines, and it has over the last 20 years um, due to improved building stock and efficiencies and conservation and better equipment, better fuel. What they're realizing is, is that can't be the only thing that they sell to, to sustain a business. They've got to be do plumbing and heating services weatherization services some have got into lawn care and, and you know the alarm companies and and, and and all sorts of different uh, some are growing hemp uh, you, you have all sorts of different side businesses that you have because the most important asset you have as a company in the energy business is number one the customer list the customer is some of these relationships date back 30 40 50 years and, and the other thing is you have an, an employee base, and I'd love to talk to you more about that, and I have when you were on the Commerce Committee, that, that has a skill, mm -hmm. which is they know how to work with combustion, and they have a commercial driver's license that allows them to drive a, a, a vehicle over 26,000 pounds. And I would, that, I is would. A, that is a very that is a very important commodity in Vermont, where we have 3.2% unemployment and a real lack of skilled labor. I would love to talk about that next because I, you know, I think Green Mountain Power has also done a very skilled job um, in terms of shifting people's perception of what they do from selling, you know, kilowatt hour to selling a service, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, beyond the, below the hood is not something that I really feel um, qualified to talk about right now, but. I think the idea of transitioning to services for like, we're the ones who take care of the pipes in your home, whether those are heating pipes or plumbing pipes, that's what we do is a really interesting shift. And I know that we're experiencing a, about to 
already experiencing a huge shortage in the trades and um, trained it's, labor it's, in the trades, but it's about to get much worse, right? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and I've been around doing this job for 15 years now. And, you know, so I was around in 2008 when the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, came around and provided funds uh, for companies to expand their services into weatherization. And, uh, and then we're seeing sort of a similar push right now out mm-hmm. of uh, legislation that's being um, pushed ahead in Senate Natural Resources Committee, yep. which I've testified on a number of times. And, and that's important, but what's different now than was then is, is that we're actually seeing, right now we saw high unemployment and we had certainly, we had 15% unemployment in April of last year, but we're now at 3.2% unemployment in Vermont. And our, our skilled labor shortage has not uh, improved. In fact, it's, it's gotten worse as um, plumbers and drivers and heat techs have, have gotten a couple of years older. Um, so, and, and because there's still demand for contractors, um, it's going to be very difficult um, to, to train the workforce that we need in Vermont, given the lack of skilled labor and, frankly, the lack of interest in skilled labor. I mean, a flagger is getting paid $20 an hour, a truck driver, $30, a plumber, $40. I mean, these are really good wages in Vermont, and, um, but yet still, there are hurdles. And, and part of that, frankly, is a, a reluctance. I don't know why um, for young people to pursue a a career in the skilled trades when it can be quite lucrative. I'm just going to jump in there quickly and remind listeners that our local economic development um, center, the Brattleboro Development Credit Corp, has been tracking high growth jobs that also come with high wages. And one of the ones they've identified for Wyndham County is CDL drivers and CDL licensing. So I just wanna put that out there. If that is something that you have any interest in at all, reach out to the BDCC because they can contact you with training programs and that type of thing. And the Department of Labor can help you with that as well. Um, And so I'm really, I've been fascinated about this for a while. And I think we've talked about it a little bit before about about the shortage and how much folks don't seem to be able to find their way into their training opportunities. I know that the issue around CDLs is really um, exacerbated by issues around um, criminal records and drug testing and a bunch of sort of other dynamics in our communities. Um, And that's, I believe really about the insurance companies and not so much about the employers, but the rest of it, you know, I talk to folks who want apprentices and I talk to folks who can't find jobs and the gap between them just, it doesn't seem to be lessening. And I don't know how to make the leap. I don't know how much of it is gender and culture and how much of it is something else, but yeah, just do you have ideas? Well, the, the first issue with regards to um, drivers. So what's interesting is that um, a commercial driver's license, while it is granted by the state of Vermont or the state of New Hampshire, it's federally regulated. So um, and marijuana is still a class one drug in the federal government. So um, um, you have to be drug tested if you are want to have a CDL. If you want to drive a vehicle over 26,000 pounds, um, you have to be regularly tested. And we run our association, we run a drug and alcohol testing program. So you have to be tested before you're hired. And then you have to be ran and you are subject to random tests throughout the year. That's a federal law, uh, which you have to, which Vermont has to comply with. Every state has to comply with. Um, in addition, you have to have a pretty extensive background check. Again, we also do that in our office in Montpelier. That's, that's part of the, the federal law. So d- Vermont can't devise a way mm-hmm. to make it easier until the federal law changes. Um, and and that's a, that is a challenge in hiring. But the other point, which is you know, the, the idea that um, stereotypes um, or the image of a, of a truck driver or a plumber or a heating tech um, being a male dominated field is true. And we are trying to stop that. Uh, we partnered with Vermont Works for Women we highlighted some um, women in, in the truck driving and plumbing and heating tech field that 
have made a difference. We have. You, you know, did a lovely have, job of that, by the way. I am. Well, you know, well, I, there's not enough of them. I, we no, really but it's wanted to. Yeah, it's hard. It's really hard to highlight diversity and not have it be cloying and painful to look at. And you did a really good job of it. I appreciate that. I mean, one of the things that we really wanted to point out was that the the appeal to the job. You know, certainly, you know, if you if you're looking across the way and you go, oh, well, there's no place for me there because I don't look like those people. And and we wanted to really highlight um, the the women that are drivers in in heating oil drivers, truck drivers, and plumbers and and heating techs on on why they like the job. And, and because there are some appealing things, um, you know, the independence, um, the, 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 the satisfaction of uh, fixing something, of installing something, of making it work. Um, there is a lot of, I think, appeal uh, for those that are mechanically inclined or enjoy uh, the challenge of, of driving a, a big rig vehicle. And, and there's a lot of financial awards too. So figuring out how to uh, emphasize that from the perspective of not the typical um, employee, but those that we're trying to, re to recruit into this field, uh, I think is important because unless Vermont changes, unless we get a different influx of people moving into Vermont, you know, we need to really focus on the young people um, and that includes men and women and people of color to realize that, that there is a opportunity here in our field and with good wages and benefits that, that they should entertain, they should consider at least. What I hear from a lot of people is that they really desperately need to hire people, but because they're so short, they don't have the space to really bring on apprentices um, or to recruit apprentices. And so it's a, I've talked to a lot of employers who are in a catch 22. They sort of know that the Department of Labor would pay for someone to be trained by them. They know that it's sort of what they should do in terms of um, legacy planning for their businesses, but the sort of extra energy that's required to do that when you're already short-staffed is really hard. And so what, I, what I've heard from a lot of people is they're just sort of, you know, shelling, as they um, move towards retirement, they're really just sort of like looking to sell their customer lists or their businesses to larger business, larger companies that can handle it. And I think that would be a big loss for Vermont. I agree. I agree. And one of the things that we would like to fix the apprenticeship program is there's a one for one ratio, right? So you have a master plumber and in order to become a, under the department of labor apprenticeship program, that master plumber has to teach, uh, can only, you know, go uh, have one master plumber. So it's a one for one ratio for the apprentice to the master plumber or the S licensed plumber, the journeyman plumber to the apprenticeship. And yes, that's ideal. There's no question, but what we, we need that master plumber who may be retiring in 18 months, we need them to train two or three. Mm -hmm. um, and if they could bring two or three on staff, or if we could bring on, you know, if we bring on a high school student in the summertime, like I, when I was a kid, I, I worked as a informal apprentice to a plumber, uh, uh, my father, <laughs> and but I obviously I didn't get any credit for it. Um, but if we could get credit to high school apprentices that are that are spending their summers working as gophers, um, that would speed the path for them to get their full apprenticeship and then mm -hmm. their license. Like if there's a way that we can help younger people um, uh, get there faster, if there's a way that we can ensure that there is a higher ratio. So one plumber and one electrician, one heating tech can work with multiple apprenticeships so that we can bring more people on faster that's going to be a big help because sooner or later that master plumber is just going to retire. And that's something that we figured out for nursing. We have LNAs that can sort of begin their journey in high school for school credit, working, you know, quite a few of them per trainer. And then you sort of stack your credentials until you're at a master's of nursing. And it's a real, um, it's a very clear and articulated path with employment opportunities at each step along the path. That's a great analogy. We need the exact same thing for the licensed and skilled trades, which I teach and I work with those people. And, so, and, and we don't have it. And, and I think part of the reason is, I, I think there is the sentiment that this is, that why are we training typewriter mechanics here? And, and, I, and I keep trying to say like the people that drive heavy duty vehicles, they're never gonna go, they're not gonna go away in the next 50 years. The people that ensure that your home is safe and warm and comfortable, that the pipes are working, they're not going to go. Yes, the technology may change, but the the 
the type S electrician license that you need to hook a boiler up to the electrical panel um, or a furnace is the same license you need to hook a heat pump. It's the same license you need to work on solar panels. So how you get there or what you end up doing 10 years from now, I don't think it matters. What matters is, is that you get the skill sets now in order to get the license that is then a ticket for a, a great um, uh, income that can support a family for the next 40 years, regardless of what you end up working on. Um, but there is the sentiment that why are we training people to hook up oil boilers to, to, to boards? Well, because that same person has a license that 50 years from now, he may be working on a different technology, but that license will still be valid and good. Thank you, Matt. Um, we are kind of getting close to the top of the hour. I wanna, as great a conversation as this is, I wanna switch gears because at least when I'm covering energy issues in my community, I hear from a number of people who are quite vocal in their distaste, distrust, dislike of biofuels, whether those are wood pellets or um, soybean oil. And their concerns are that these are, these are paths that are, have basically been greenwashed, that they're just as bad for the environment and for particularly air quality as fossil fuels. So I'm wondering Matt, if you can address those, those comments broadly from your perspective. Sure, there's no question that the, that the best energy way you can save energy is by not using it. And that there's a way that you can increase efficiency with your vehicles or use them less or weatherize your home. So your demand, your thermal demand is lower that's the best possible outcome rather than converting from whatever fuel uh, you choose, natural gas, heating oil, propane, wood, um, electricity. Um, so that's understood. Um, but with that, there are certain, you either, you're either putting the, yes, if you burn anything, you're creating air issues. But heating oil has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. And it has so because of the um, uh, 2011 Energy Act signed by Governor Shumlin, which required all heating oil to be an ultra low sulfur fuel, reducing the particulate matter that comes out of the smokestack, uh, making it a cleaner fuel, the same type of, of, of uh, law that the federal government passed in the 1990s, which reduced smog over big cities because it reduced the particulate matter in diesel fuel for all those big trucks. Um, there have been new regulations with regards to uh, uh, wood stoves, both chunk wood and pallet woods that reduce the amount of particulate matter in the air. That's important. Um, but yes, you're still burning stuff. You're still sending stuff into the air and that's understood. But there's always going to be a negative externality, some sort of consequence with any energy source, even solar, even wind, uh, even hydro. Um, and I guess that's all part of our understanding of, of, of if we need energy to get from here to there, to power our factories and to heat our homes uh, or to cool our homes. Um, that's the bargain that we have to make. And, and you know, I, uh, you have to make choices. And my particular point of view is that we can't put all our energy eggs in one basket, that we should have a multiple choices and that these choices should compete on their own merits, both from an affordability perspective and from a uh, low carbon perspective. That's why I'm excited about the idea of biodiesel and biomass complementing efforts to green the electric grid and provide more uh, thermal and transportation through electricity because I think that competition, that marketplace uh, is going to create new innovations that lower our carbon emissions and lower costs for consumers. I really, um, one of the reasons I really like talking to you, Matt, is because you help bring nuance to an issue when it's really hard to have politics, um, have nuance in politics most days, especially around some of these more hot button issues. And well, so- I'm a politician now. You know, I, I know you know, are, you are. Council. You're really, you got to practice, practice that, yeah. um, that talking in the state house and then take it to your city council. Um, congratulations on your win. Thank you again. very much. Um, so, 
You know, I think part of the job of government is to either put a price on externalities or put an incentive, an incentive in place in order to move us um, away from negative externalities. But what I think is important to name and what we often lose track of is the fact that there are these negative externalities in almost any solution we come up with. And you mentioned, you know, batteries, um, the impact of rare earth materials and the mining of rare earth materials for batteries is something we don't talk about very often is really profound, intense, um, horrific child labor, horrific colonial policies. Um, you know, we could have shows and shows and books and books on that, but that is really intense and something that we should really be aware of as we sort of jump to the future. There's what happens at peaker plants um, when we move to an electric grid. There is what are, you know, as we move away from wood fuel, what happens to our forests if they are less managed and how do we make sure that we are moving, if we move towards wood, how are we making sure that we're using the best possible wood for that and not, you know, removing forests that should be maintained. So it's all, I think, as we have a mix and a meaningful mix that meets people's financial needs, as well as the policy goals we have to, you know, actually have a planet in a few years um, that's habitable. I think it's really important to continue to have these conversations that have the nuance, that name the externalities, that we're going into this clear headed and clear eyed um, so that we can stop arguing about the science, start arguing about the math. And then maybe after we stop arguing about the math, the next step is to really get clear on what ethical choices we're making and what sacrifices we're making in each direction. Because no matter what we choose, there is not going to be, we can't consume at the same level we're consuming at and think we're not making any um, damages or sacrifices somewhere on the globe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. We have just a few minutes before the end of the show. I wanna to toss it to you, uh, Matt. Any thoughts, concepts, perspectives you wanna leave our community with? Um, yeah, I, I would just say that uh, I love Wyndham County. Um, I don't live there anymore, but my parents still do. My, my wife's uh, family still lives there. Uh, you live in a, in a wonderful community um, that I'm proud to call my, my hometown still in, in many ways, even though I've lived in many different places. Um, you've got beautiful you know, uh, buildings with amazing history. And um, I, I'm, I always consider myself a Wyndham County guy, even though I've lived in Washington County and, and Chittenden County and in California, Washington, DC, but um, so that's all. Thank you, Matt. Emily, any last minute thoughts? No, I'm just really happy to be sort of opening up this next phase in the conversation and um, looking forward to seeing the level of deliberation and the, con and the results of the conversations that the Climate Council um, comes out yeah. with in the next few months. Definitely, thank you. Well, shall we toast? We always, since this is a happy hour, Matt, we always, we always end with a toast. We used to have cocktails, but it's, we've been doing this earlier and earlier in the morning lately. Right. And so now we just, just didn't work. Coffee. <laughs> yes. coffee. Yeah. Um, to continuing to have meaningful, respectful debate and bringing nuance to all of the tough challenges ahead. Thanks for joining us. You're thank here, you. thank you. And thank you everyone who tuned in today. Uh, I have to apologize for some of the sound quality. We are having big windstorms, at least in Dummerston, and I can tell it's been affecting our internet signal. It's Vermont, hey. The Montpelier Happy Hour is on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro every Friday at 2 p.m. You can also find us on YouTube and the Montpelier Happy Hour Facebook page, as well as MontpelierHappyHour.Captivate.FM, as well as iTunes. We are just all over the place. Matt Coda, Emily Kornheiser, thank you for joining us. Emily, where can people find you? You can go to emilykornheiser.org where you can find links to all of my social media accounts as well as my weekly community conversation every Sunday at 11 a.m. via Zoom. Have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs>